Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this AP Chemistry video, we're learning about electron configurations and periodic properties that we find on the periodic table. Now, since this is AP Chemistry, I do expect that at some level, you know how to write electron configurations. If for some reason you've forgotten, then I have another video that will show you the fundamentals of that. But for now, let's just take a look at practicing this. And so, here is a periodic table annotated with the sublevels and how they correspond on the periodic table. So let's try carbon. So carbon is right here on the periodic table. You might remember that we always have to start at the very beginning of the table. So you start with 1s, and there are two elements in that 1s block, so we'll say 1s2. And then we go on to 2s, which has two boxes, so we'll say 2s2. And then we have the carbon is in the 2p section, so that it has two boxes there to get to carbon, so it's 2p2, and so it looks like this. Now there is another way to write electron configurations that's a little bit shorter. It's abbreviated, where we basically look at the previous noble gas, which would be helium in this case, at that particular spot on the table, and then we just continue from there. So after helium, it's 2s2, 2p2, so it's a little bit shorter. Now if we have calcium, calcium is right here on the periodic table, can we write its electron configuration as well? Once again, we have to start with 1s2, then we have 2s2, then we have 2p6, we go all the way through this time, there are six boxes in the 2p section, and then back around to 3s2, and then 3p6, six boxes in the 3p section, then back around to 4s, and there are two boxes to get to calcium, so it ends with 4s2. So there's our electron configuration. Now, if we want to do this in the abbreviated way, well, we look at the previous noble gas, which I believe would be argon in this case, and then from argon, it's just going to be 4s2, so it's, it's going to look like this. And so this abbreviated way of writing electron configurations is kind of a nice shortcut to help us uh, to, to write these in a much shorter way. Let's try one that's quite a bit longer. Let's try niobium. Nb is its symbol. And so, once again, to write the full configuration, we start from the very beginning with 1s2, and then 2s2, and then 2p6, back around to 3s2, 3p6, back around to 4s2. 3d has 10 boxes in it, as you can see if you count those. And then 4p6, back around to 5s2. And then 4d1, 2, 3. So it ends with 4d3. And of course, the abbreviated version we'd have to uh, go to the uh, noble gas right before that, which would be, looks like that's going to be uh, krypton this time. And so krypton and then 5s2, 4d3. So in this case, the abbreviated version is much shorter. Now, Once again, this is a very quick way of going through this. If you haven't learned this yet or you're confused or need some review, then I'd like for you to watch my video on how to write electron configurations in much more uh, detail. What we're going to do right now, though, is take a look at what we call orbital notation of electron configurations. So we're going to take the electron configuration for, let's say, carbon, since we uh, started out with that, and we're going to place these into orbitals. Now, when I say orbitals, that means 1s has one orbital in it, the 2 S sublevel has one orbital, and the 2 P sublevel has three. And when we assign these, we're going to always assign them in a very specific order, in which we start with the, uh, the lowest energy, which is 1 S, and then we work our way to higher energy, like 2 S and 2 P. That's called the Aufbau principle. The Aufbau principle says that we add electrons to these sublevels in a very specific order of increasing energy. That's why we do 1s first, 
and then 2s, and then 2p, and then 3s, and it goes in that very specific order. We don't add electrons in just random order. You know, we'll do 2s here, and then we'll do a 4p, and then we'll have a 1s, and then a 3d. No, it goes in a very specific order, and that's the Aufbau principle, uh, which basically comes from the German word. Aufbau is the German word for uh, in ascending order, from what I understand. So we're always going to start with 1s2, so we'll put... Uh, 1s and then we have 2 and don't forget that each line or each orbital can have a maximum of two electrons in it. Now we have 2s and we have 2s2 so we have that and then we have 2p2 so the first arrow goes up in the first line now where should the second arrow go? Does it go on the same line? Well from first year, year chemistry hopefully you remember that it goes on the second line and that's something called Hund's rule. Hund's rule basically says that no electron in a sublevel can be paired up until every orbital in that sublevel has been occupied. So we have to go over to the second line here to put the second electron. So that's Hund's rule that shows why we have the two unpaired electrons in carbon. Now, before we we go any further, some, just some vocabulary here. The 2p, for example, that's a sublevel. Okay, this whole thing is a sublevel, but each line represents an orbital. Okay, every orbital can have a maximum of two electrons. Now let's try another one. Let's try one that's a little bit more complex. We'll try selenium this time, and here's the electron configuration for that. It ends with 4s2, 3d10, 4p4. So this time we have quite a few uh, more sublevels to add in here. And so we're going to start with 1s. Oh, before I, before I do that, I should let you know that s will always have one orbital, p has three, and this is the first time we have a d, and so it has five orbitals. If we ever get to f, it will have seven orbitals. It always goes with the odd numbers, you know, one, three, five, seven, S, P, D, and F. Very rarely will we get to F in AP chemistry. Uh, usually the highest that we go will be D with five orbitals. Now, remember that when we put the arrows on the lines, you might have noticed in, in the last example that we had the first arrow going up and the second arrow was going down. Now, the name for that rule is called the Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle. And that tells us that no two electrons in an atom can have the same quantum states. Now, we can describe electrons using something we call quantum numbers. Now, that's not included in the AP Chemistry course curriculum, but for our purposes in AP Chemistry, we can say that basically what that means is the two electrons in an orbital have to spin in opposite directions. So if the first arrow is going up, the second arrow would have to be going down. So if one is spinning in this direction, the other is spinning in the opposite direction. Okay, now that's kind of hard to think about, but that's how they're spinning. In 2s, we have the 2s2, then 2p6, we can put, you know, the first three and then the the last three to show you that we're following Hund's rule. Then we have 3s2 and 3p6. For brevity, I'll just put all six in there. And then 4s2 and 3d10. We'll stick those all in there. And then for, for 4p4, remember we have to follow Hund's rule, so it goes one, two, three, and then for, four, for that last electron, the fourth one, we'll have to pair up. So here is the orbital uh, diagram notation for selenium. Now I'd like for you to notice that this electron, or not this electron, but this atom has how many unpaired electrons? Do you see it has two unpaired electrons? It has one right here. It has one unpaired electron right there. There are two unpaired electrons here. Anytime you have an atom with unpaired electrons, we call that paramagnetic. Paramagnetic. Now, there are some pretty neat things that uh, paramagnetic materials can do, and I'm not going to 
talk about that in depth in this video, but you will actually notice that it is possible to attract a substance that's paramagnetic if you have a strong enough magnet. It's, it's actually a pretty neat little uh, thing to try. Let's try one more example here. Let's try argon this time, and there's the electron configuration for argon, and it looks like it has one, two, three, four, five sublevels, and so I'll plot those here, and we'll put those in. We have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and 3p6. And so that's the orbital diagram notation for argon. Now, I want you to notice there are no unpaired electrons here. If we look at you know, every arrow, every electron, it has a partner. So since there are no unpaired electrons here, this is called diamagnetic, diamagnetic. And so the way we remember this is that, I know that uh, it's, it's kind of corny, but it would rather die than be attracted to a magnet, okay? You can't attract argon or pretty much any diamagnetic material to a magnet in that uh, a paramag it's not paramagnetic at all, it's diamagnetic. Now, when we talk about orbitals, it might be useful to talk about what is an orbital. Well, an orbital is not some sort of a, uh, like a hard shell or some sort of an orbit, uh, to say that exactly. An orbital is just a region of space where you are most likely to find an electron. And so, for example, if you're at a school, uh, as an example of this, we could say that a hallway is a region of space where you're most likely to find students in between classes. And if you look at where students are between classes and plot that, you'd have your hallway. Well, let's do something similar for an s electron. So here I have, we'll have an s orbital, and we'll just plot where the electron could be at different little uh, snapshots in time. So here we have, this is not a bunch of electrons, this is just one electron. And so we have plotted where this electron is in the s orbital at several dozen different points in time. And you might notice that it has a kind of a certain shape to it. We can draw what looks to be kind of a, a sphere around here and say that the s orbital is roughly spherical in its shape. Now if we go on to the p orbital here, let's take a look at that one. Now if we do, do the same thing for a p orbital and just do like a, uh, a little bunch of snapshots of where a p electron would be most likely to be, well, we get something that looks like this. Once again, this is one electron, one electron in a p orbital. And notice it's not spherical. We can actually say that it's more like a figure eight shape, if you want to say that. And then we can look at a d orbital. And so if we look at d orbitals, once again, this is one electron in a d orbital, and we just plotted it, just took a bunch of different snapshots as to where that electron might be at different points in time. And this time, it looks more like a butterfly or perhaps a four-leaf clover. And so those are the shapes of the orbitals, okay? If we say S is spherical, P has this dumbbell or kind of a figure eight shape, and then a d orbital looks like a four-leaf clover or perhaps a butterfly, however you wanted to describe that. Now, and notice that electrons sometimes leave that region of space. Normally, we say that electrons will spend about 90% of their time in the orbital. They can venture out of there, uh, just like students sometimes venture out of the hallways during the time between classes. They may go to the restroom or to the office or somewhere else. But generally speaking, electrons spend 90% of their time in the orbital, and so that's how we define that region of space that we call the orbital. Now, to give you an idea as to what an atom really looks like, um, I have all these orbitals, and in a real atom, this is what it would look like. Uh, the nucleus, if you can imagine this, is right here in the middle. Looks like a Band-Aid for some reason in this uh, picture. But the nucleus is in there, and all of the atoms' sublevels are superimposed over each other. And so you can tell that there might be an s orbital in here, and then there are three p orbitals 
you know, in these different directions. And then there's a 3 uh, S, it's larger. But these are all superimposed on top of one each on top of one another. And so it can be kind of confusing to keep track of where these electrons are, but it seems to be, it looks chaotic, but it's actually very, uh, very amazing how these electrons have this, uh, th this orbital shape in each orbital. Well, once again, this has been a brief review of electron configurations and how to write orbital a diagram notation, and what orbitals are. I hope you learned a little bit of chemistry. If you haven't already subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. And if you uh, learned something here or like my video, then please smash that like button. I hope you uh, have uh, found by now that this is part of my AP Chemistry Complete course. You can get the whole AP Chemistry course on this channel. Uh, and over the next few weeks and months, they'll be posted. So join me again, and I hope that we can learn some more chemistry together. together.